to the seventh show of the Sounds of Movement. We're going to bring you a kind of audio book listening experience today, based on the book Caliban and the Witch by Silvia Federici, who was in Vienna just a while ago in May 2013, talking about um, this book which deals with um, women, the body and primitive accumulation. So it's a kind of historical study of the witch hunts in relation to the development of capitalism and the way that capitalism and these developments dealt with the bodies of women and their roles within communities. Uh, this book has just been translated into German, very, very worthwhile read, uh, with the Mandelbaum Verlag, and it originally appeared with Autonomedia in 2004. I'm going to start by giving you some idea as to why I began this work that resulted in Caliban and the Witch. And then I'll touch to some of the main themes on the book. And uh, also try to show why this kind of historical work is so important also for the present, not only to understand the past, but also to understand the present. I was inspired to work on to in begin this research by my activism in the women's movement. And the whole climate you know, that uh, developed in the late 60s and 70s with the rise of the feminist movement, I was at the United States at the time, and also the rise of the black power movement. And this was also a moment, an historical political moment that was very uh, closely shaped by the influence of the anti-colonial struggle that was still ongoing. For example, in parts of Africa, you still had anti-colonial liberation movements. Uh, and all of these struggles, all these movements, in a way, you know, challenge the classical Marxist socialist account of the development of modern history and development of capitalism, and really pose the need to rethink a whole uh, history from the point of view of a world of historical subjects that in Marx are in a sense very much in the background. They're really not uh, in the foreground. And in my case in particular, I was very, very interested in understanding what had happened to women in the process of the transformation of society from a feudal mode of production to a capitalist mode of production. And already uh, in my feminist activism, I had become quite uh, assured that uh, the Marxist account uh, of uh, capitalist accumulation and Marxist account of uh, what are the mechanisms that keep capitalism reproducing itself, reproducing itself on an expanded scale, were somewhat lacking. Uh, that, in fact, entire area of uh, social life, of entire areas of exploitation of labor, right, were, in fact, missing. And in particular, the area that was missing was that area that we identify as the reproduction of labor power. In other words, um, Throughout the 70s, you know, we had a whole um, network of feminist activists who began to do work, starting from a Marxist perspective, but with the intent of going beyond Marx and reinterpreting, in a sense, the history of capitalism and the function of capitalism from the point of view that we had come to develop in looking at the history of women and the position of women in contemporary capitalist society. In particular, for us, very important was the, the realization that what was missing in the account of the Marxist tradition was precisely that all area of activity to which to, in our knowledge, women have been confined in capitalist society, and specifically those activities that are geared to the reproduction of everyday life, the reproduction of individual, but in capitalism have been subsumed to the reproduction of the workforce. Uh, 
right? And uh, in particular, those activities that we often refer to as housework, domestic labor, but also procreation, which we have, in fact, analyzed and basically concluded that these activities were not outside of the sphere of capitalist economy, but in fact were very, very central to the maintenance and perpetuation of a capitalist economy to the extent that this activity reproduced on a daily and generational base the workforce. So coming from this perspective that uh, in fact uh, shaped my theory but also my activism, I was involved in a network uh, that campaign for wages for housework um, on the basis that, on the argument that uh, um, all these activities uh, in the capitalism have been made invisible and the continued exploitation of women uh, and women's unpaid labor in the home has been made possible because this work has been unwaged. Coming from this perspective, I decided I wanted to understand what actually had been the historical processes, you know, by which, in fact, this situation had been created. In other words, looking through the books of the founding father, looking through Engels, looking through Marx, uh, myself and other feminists I collaborated with could not really find an account of the transformation that had led to the creation, for example, of the housewife as the, the unpaid houseworker, as one of the dominant figure, one of the dominant female figure in the configuration of capitalist relation. In other words, what was the history of housework? How that particular work had been created? Again, coming from a perspective that refused the standard dominant idea that this work uh, represents some sort of legacy of a pre-capitalist society. In other words, the perspective I approached, with which I approached the historical work that resulted in the book, was a perspective that posited that the kind of sexual division of labor that has prevailed in the history of capitalism has not been a legacy of a pre-capitalist world, but rather has been a capitalist construction. And uh, in other words, it's been a social construct. My interest was to understand how this construction had taken place, what historical development had led to it. And of course, added to my theories already about the nature of work in capitalism, housework, and so forth, was also the assumption that you cannot approach history from the point of view of an abstract universal subject, especially uh, the history of capitalism, which has been a history of uh, division. It's been a, a history of creation of differences, creation of hierarchies. So I began to do the work of uh, reconstructing the history of capitalism. And uh, this was a kind of, took me on a kind of journey. And as you know, you will see when you read Caliban and the Witch, which I hope you will, you will inspire to do if you have not done it already. Uh, that basically led me to way back to rethink also the feudal mode of production, to rethink the reasons why capitalist society, why capitalist relation developed, why capitalism to begin with. Uh, and this was an extremely important work. Uh, one chapter of the book is devoted to it, and uh, it's a primarily focus on the struggles and the social movements that took place throughout the Middle Ages, particularly in the later part of the, of the feudal world, of the medieval world, uh, which were social movements that were directed both against feud feudal power. For example, you have massive peasant movement. By the way, this is area 
or Carinthia is one area that saw in the 15th century by massive peasant wars and uh, that shook up uh, you know, the power of the feudal lords. Um, these were not isolated episodes. You know, throughout the Middle Ages, you have a growth of social movements, uh, many times taking very sophisticated cultural form. For example, what I call social heresy, that were critical of the power structure, critical of feudal domination, of the kind of exploitation that was taking place. For example, the fact that the, the peasantry, they had the farmers had to give every year certain tributes to the Lord in labor as well as in kind. They were also opposed to the church. Uh, and they were also opposed, these movements, particularly in the cities, they were opposed to the beginning of a process of commercialization. You know, by the 14th century, in many European towns, you begin to see the beginning, the beginning of commerce. Uh, and uh, also a beginning, if not of manufacture, of but large concentration of artisans. And I discover a whole world that uh, generally you do not study in school. You know, we are very rarely told that there was a tremendous class struggle taking place in the feudal world. And that it was by virtue of this struggle that, capital, that feudalism by the 14th century and of course the 15th century in a sense entered into a terminal crisis. And by terminal crisis I refer to the fact that the feudal class could not really reproduce itself. Uh, it could not in fact uh, reproduce its power, could not, for instance, force the peasantry to pay you know, the taxation uh, that uh, they owed to them uh, every year. And you begin to have a situation which is very interesting and very modern. You know, this class of serfs who were supposedly tied to the mm -hmm. land, more and more disentangled themselves. You know, today we speak of exodus as a form of struggle. Right? And in fact, flight, the flight to the city, the exodus from the land of the lords, the moving from uh, one estate to another estate uh, was very much part of this massified rebellion that you find at the end of the Middle Ages. So I began, first of all, to really rethink the crisis of feudalism and to realize that uh, the development of capitalism had nothing to do with the kind of evolutionary perspective that I'd always be taught, you know, coming from both liberal economists as well as socialist uh, political theorists. Uh, that in fact it was a product of a, basically of a class struggle that uh, created the need for the new form, new type of relation that would restore uh, the power uh, of the ruling class in a way, you know, to uh, command labor. Mm -hmm. And what was very interesting also in looking at this uh, world of struggle was to realize that particularly in the context of the erratic movement, women have played a crucial role. And for example, you have heretic movements that uh, not only challenge the, the power, the economic power of the feudal class, but they also challenge the church. They challenge the control that the church had on people's lives. Uh, they also called for, in a way, a strike on the level of procreation, arguing that when you are a slave, that when you are enslaved, you should not reproduce, that the moment of procreation is the moment of bringing new people into slavery. And for example, the Carthus movement, which was very, very influential, and the Carthus movement, according to many historians, played a role also in the development of the ideology of witchcraft, in other words, 
when you have the first demonologies, right? The development of the idea that there are sects of people who are witches, right? Was very much influenced according, at least in the first period, according to many story by the cattle movement, right? Who was a movement that uh, in fact had egalitarian, somewhat egalitarian practices towards women, allowed women to, for example, administer the sacraments, right? allowed women to become priestesses, uh, and also was critical of marriage and critical of procreation with the idea that procreation, in fact, is the act by which the soul becomes entrapped into the body. And this was, of course, a metaphor for entrapment into societies where people obviously uh, were still in, enslaved. So I realized that to in order to understand the rise of capitalism, I had first of all to understand the struggle and see that capitalism was a response to specific movement and uh, that not surprisingly not surprisingly, at the dawn of capitalism, we find a phenomenon uh, such as the two centuries long, actually more than two centuries long, witch hunt that uh, spread throughout Europe from uh, Switzerland, uh, part of what today we call Germany, Italy, France, then into England, Scotland, a phenomenon that, as you probably know, uh, led to the arrest, torture, and execution of uh, hundreds of thousands of women. There's a whole debate as to the number. Sometimes those numbers have been very much inflated. Some people have spoken of millions and millions of women being actually uh, executed, but I try to uh, take a sort of intermediate position between those who speak of millions and those who speak of few thousand. Clearly, we can speak of hundreds of thousands, and that's already an incredible number, without mentioning those who were arrested and tortured, did not die at the stake, but their life were ruined forever. Now, question that for me uh, was raised from a very early point is why? Why this incredible attack on women, which is certainly unprecedented historically? I don't think you can find in any other society or in any other historical moment you know, such a gender-specific persecution, right? Such a gender-specific, the fact that you have a, a um, persecution that targets particularly women, and in a sense presents women as a, a population that is particularly vulnerable to do evil, particularly uh, disposed right, to be corrupted by, by the power of the devil, and particularly prone, in a sense, to evil doing. You know, why, why this phenomenon? And of course, I realized that uh, this, the witch hunt had very little to do with the religious superstition, which often, at least in the past, this was uh, the dominant theory in the Enlightenment, you know, by the very interesting, by the late 18th century, you know, when throughout Europe the witch hunts begin to subside. Right, you find less and less trials. Right? With the rise of the Enlightenment, you begin to have the theory that this was just the superstition, this was just the church, and that we can forget this phenomenon. And in fact, despite its enormity, its atrocity, you know, for decades, you can say that for more than a century, the witch hunts were hardly ever taken seriously by historians. Very few historians have seriously uh, studied this period and studied this persecution. It, you can say that it was really the feminist movement who brought back the spotlight 
you know, on this phenomenon. And in, uh, in fact, in many demonstrations, the figure of the witch, you know, was used as a symbol of women's revolt. You know, there was a demonstration in Italy in the 70s in which actually the women began to make big circles and to sing, you know, tremble, tremble, witches have come back. And so, you know, the women, women, the, you know, the women's movement was a movement that had many, many levels and many dimensions. And one dimension was the attempt to recreate our history, right? The fact that women have been absent from history. I don't know uh, if any of you has ever read uh, Virginia Woolf, right? When she speaks about going to the library and wanting to read about the history of women and finding shelves either completely empty or finding shelves of books uh, of uh, books written by men about women, right? Well, the women's movement tried to fill those shelves. And uh, so in many ways, we had many, many study groups that went back looking at different moments of history. And of course, the witch hunt came immediately you know, to our eyes. And there were many booklets, pamphlets about witches, and uh, this is where I was very much inspired to do much more, uh, try to analyze much more seriously than was usually done this work. Also because in the feminist movement there was a sort of mythologization of the witch. Uh, very, very often the way the, the witch uh, was seen in some of these pamphlets that circulated uh, she was seen as a sort of a mythical figure. Right? Many times she was represented as the, in a sense, embodiment of a kind of matriarchal cult, matriarchal religious cults that had survived, you know, the witches as the embodiment, the priestesses of an old archaic matriarchal re religion that had, in a sense, been driven underground uh, by the, the church, but had survived, and now the church was persecuting them. Well, in my work, I was not able to verify in any way, you know, this position, this image. Uh, in fact, the kind of work that I have done uh, shows that the witch was not any particular figure, except the witch was a very often a very... Uh, the average woman, but the woman of the peasantry, the woman of the incipient proletariat, uh, the woman who uh, at the end, with the beginning of capitalist society, was being dispossessed. And I will return to this point uh, in, a, in, in a minute. So I wanted to really also demythologize this figure of the witch and instead bring back the witch hunt to its historical context. So this was another, it's another objective that uh, the, the book has. And uh, very, very early I realized that there is a, a set of coincidences, particularly chronological coincidences relating to the witch hunt that make it extremely uh, revealing. Uh, first of all, the fact that this witch hunt took place very much at the same time as the slave trade, the beginning of the slave trade, they took place very much uh, at the same years as uh, the beginning of a mass expulsion of the peasantry, you know, from uh, the lands that they had in use in the many medieval villages, particularly in England, right? And also take place in pretty much at the time of the beginning of the colonization. Um, the period of the, the, the most intense period of, for the witch hunts is the period between 1550 and 1650. That's the century in which you have not only a few trials, but you really have many, many dozens and dozens of trials uh, in variety in many countries, from, as I said, from Germany, France, England, Scotland, 
so this this chronology is revealing because it shows that the period of greatest intensity of the witch hunts is a period in which feudal relation had already been extinguished and in which you already have the beginning you know, of a, the, uh, a capitalist uh, development in which you have already the, those who are shaping the economy and the political economy uh, of uh, parts of great parts of Europe are proto-capitalist. In other words, they are uh, the beginning of entrepreneurs who are not living any longer out of feudal rent, but actually they are living you know, out of the <coughs> creation of a new market economy. Right? So that the witch hunt, in a way, it's really coeval with the development of a market economy. And this, in my view, posed the need to understand what is the relationship you know, between the, this persecution, the crime of which these women were accused, and uh, the necessities that were posed by the development of capitalism. In Marxian terms, as you know, those of you who have read Marx know that this is the period that Marx speaks of as primitive accumulation. Right? Primitive accumulation because it's the moment, the time, when capitalism has to amass the most basic means of production, which at the time were the land, and then the bodies of people, right? workers. Primitive accumulation, Marx says, is the accumulation of workers. So the question that uh, I had was, what does the witch hunt have to do with the accumulation of workers? and with this process of accumulation, right? And what is the relationship between the witch hunts <coughs> to the other phenomenon that laid the foundation of capitalist society, like, again, the expulsion of uh, people from the land, <coughs> the process of colonization, and so forth. Uh, and much of the a good part of the book is attempting to answer this question. And in fact, uh, what I try to present, it's a very multidimensional uh, landscape, picture, uh, because clearly the intensity and the ferocity of that persecution, right, you know, shows to anybody who approaches it that you cannot answer the question that I raised, you know, with one single, in, with one single factor. In other words, it became very clear to me that the witch hunt, in fact, uh, was a process, a persecution that accomplished many, many different objectives and was not directed to destroy, you know, to persecute or criminalize any particular form of behavior, but fundamentally was an attack on a whole population, a whole way of living. Of course, uh, particular practices were targeted, but more generally, it was an attack on a whole way of living that more and more seemed very not incompatible with the kind of social relation that capitalism needed to establish itself. And I always make the comparison between the witch hunt and the war on terror. You know, today the war on terror has very similar characteristics, right? Even though it may have been developed to uh, target specific groups, specific type, of behavior, nevertheless, now it has taken an almost metaphysical <laughs> quality and to the point that it can be appealed to in many, many different uh, contexts. Right? So the, the label of terrorism, of terrorist, now goes way beyond uh, you know, some of the, the people, subjects, you know, for which was initially uh, developed, right? So 
I began to, to think of um, persecutions that are typical of moments of great historical change. Right? Those moments when uh, people's lives have to be transformed, which is what capitalism attempted to do, what capitalism did in Europe, particularly in the 16th, 17th century, that not only expropriated people, impoverished them economically by taking away the land, right, by bringing into Europe masses of silver from the American colonies that created markets, that created a, a sand prices skyrocketing, the prices of foodstuff, the prices of grain, creative massive impoverishment, um, but also had to change how people thought, how people behaved, social relations, how people related to each other. It had to transform the conception of sexuality. Uh, in this is, to my understanding, the witch hunt played a, a major role, a central role in that transformation. You know, Pogliani speaks of the great transformation that capitalism brings about in history, a great transformation. Well, more and more, it became clear to me, and this is one of the theses of the book, that the witch hunts of the 16th, 17th century were very much part of that great transformation and have been a fundamental element of the creation of modern capitalist society. Uh, why? 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 What, what in particular? What are the areas of, of life that the witch hunts uh, transform? Right? And uh, also, why women? Uh, I began looking into the question by understanding, trying to understand who were these witches? Who were the witches? What kind of, from what uh, social class they come from? And also what kind of crimes they were accused of? And uh, in a sense, what were the consequences, which is also very important, what were the consequences of their persecution? And the picture that developed it's a very powerful picture because you f I found that in particular three, four types of crimes are continuously recurrent, which uh, have a correspondence in some of the transformations that were really uh, promoted you know, by the, the new capitalist class and, uh, and also find a correspondence in some of the legislation that was being passed at the time. And that's very important, you know, because when you start reading the description of the accusation, the description of the trial, or the books, that the demonologists, because there was a whole uh, production of textbooks, right? A whole production of textbooks uh, about explaining who are the witches, what they do, what you're supposed to do with them, you know. Uh, even how do you arrest them because of their powers, right? You, when you begin to read this material, you, you want to, you feel like, okay, let's close it. I don't want to hear more because it's so crazy. It doesn't make any sense, you know, people flying, people uh, copulating with the devil, flying in the night uh, hundreds of miles away to these big meetings where you have these orgies, uh, women cooking children into the big pots, uh, making grease, making butter with the children's bones, and then uh, putting these, this, uh, you know, unguents into their body and gaining the power to fly. Like, the temptation, of course, is to say these people were mad. These people were mad, and it's impossible to make any sense of it, right? But in reality, when you begin to then see at the end what were actually they have practices that through all this very mystifying ideology were being targeted. You see that at the end of it, they are very, very prosaic type of, of practices. In, for example, in particular, theft, you know, a tax on property, 
right? Like, uh, for example, as I said, theft, begging. Hmm? Many, many witches were very, very poor women, older women, who were living out of begging, going around the neighborhood and asking for some food, asking for some wine, for some butter. You know, people refused them, the better off. They cursed, and the curse was a big thing in, uh, and taken quite seriously. And then, soon enough, they were accused of having killed the child, killed the cow, and then would be rounded up and, uh, and brought to trial. Or in another case, so, and who are these older women? These are, these are the women uh, who, uh, you know, when you, when you see this, uh, the, the population of uh, begging women, you know, accused of being witches, you realize that you are now in a social context of people who obviously had nothing, had been expropriated, didn't have any land any longer, didn't have any source of income. Maybe their daughters or, or other children, the, the men had taken the road because they had been kicked off the land, right? So you can make a connection between that begging. You can make a connection between the fact that you have all these people begging now and the fact that obviously these were societies that had gone through where people had gone through a massive process of impoverishment, right, of pauperization. Right? People are not born beggars. Right? People are not born poor. Right? So the, the large presence of the poor that you see beginning with the 16th, 17th century, these are two centuries in which poverty becomes a mass phenomenon. And out of this poverty come this figure of the begging and cursing woman or the woman who is accused of stealing from her neighbor with magical arts. This is another charge against witches. So why is she stealing? So it's like really clear the attack on property. Or many are accused of devouring, going out at night and taking the forms of animals, transforming themselves into animals, and eating the chicken and cows of their neighbor. So it's very, it's very clear, it's very revealing. You don't have to, you know, have study marks to figure out that these are obviously, you know, that there is a class war taking place in these villages. There is a class war where there is a whole population of people, and particularly older women who obviously were those at the bottom of the scale and those who could not leave the village, uh, who were especially targeted because they were those who were most dependent precisely on this form of micro-warfare, right? Micro-warfare. Another important crime, uh, they, they uh, charged the witches were killing children. And this is a very, very, very prominent charge, right? The, the, the witches, witches are a sect that kills children. There is a whole paper board, you know, one of those documents that the popes would periodically issue with all targeting specific crimes. And this one was specifically on witchcraft, and it's all, it's all about contraception, it's all about abortion, and it's all about witches making men impotent, right? And so, Today we'll speak of witchcraft having to do with the reproductive crime. Why? So why, you ask yourself, why now you have a class of uh, proto-capitalist class that is so concerned with the question of procreation? It's very interesting that I've done uh, quite a bit of research on the relationship, the position of the Middle Age, the church in the Middle Age on, on abortion. And actually, uh, the church was not so averse. So you don't have the kind of demonization and criminalization, even by the church, on abortion uh, in the Middle Ages that you have later on, after the 16th and 17th century. 
It's very interesting also that throughout the Middle Ages, there was no notion that at conception, you know, you had, in a way, the beginning of real life. You know, there was this notion, I don't know if any of you have read, at least in the English literature, there was this notion in the English countries, there was this notion of the quickening. Right? In other words, it's not the moment of conception where life takes shape, but it's the quickening. The quickening is when the woman begins to feel something moving in her body. So there was this kind of uh, you know, period in which in the Middle Ages you could still abort. And there are some of the penitential, the books that were used for, the priest used for the confession. And the penitential were very, pretty tolerant. But then you have now, with the witch hunt, anything, right, any practice that is uh, seen as interfering with reproduction is now looked at as demonic, right? And in fact, if you were a woman, you had to be very, very careful to stay away from anything that could be construed as being uh, you know, a form of contraception. So I, I, in my, I developed my theory in the, in the book is that this is very much connected you know, with a whole new concern that is evident in many other spheres of economic and social life, a new concern with the question of procreation and with the question of population, population growth, and the relation between population growth and economic growth. I know that I'm using modern terms, but actually the first capitalist economists who are called mercantilists, the mercantilists were basically those who were uh, drafting the first rudimentary element of a capitalist economic, right? One of their foundations, one of their foundational theory was the more bodies, the more wealth. And what they said actually was the more poor people, the more wealth, right? So this idea, the labor, hi. Yes, good to see you. Small world, <laughs> excuse me. Um, the idea that, uh, you know, in a sense, the body, this, this, this conception of the body and labor as the producer of wealth, right? And, and here we can sp spend a long time actually discussing this question because it's clear that whereas exploitation has a long history, many societies, not all, but many societies have exploited labor, right? So capitalism is not the first society based on, on exploitation. Nevertheless, capitalism exploits people in a particular way and, and uh, builds its power and economic, social, and political, right? On, on a, an intensive exploitation of labor. And capitalism has a different conception of labor than previous societies. And uh, in the sense that it sees labor as the fundamental source of wealth. You know, for example, in many pre-capitalist societies, you are rich and powerful if you have a lot of land. Mm -hmm. The more land you have, the more wealth. With capitalism changes, it's not how much land you have, but how many workers you have, and how much intensely you can exploit them, right? That comes later. Hmm? That comes later, the intensity of exploitation. In the early phase of capitalism, when you have a low level of technological development, how many bodies you can amass, how much labor power you can amass, it's really the source of wealth. And so you find, for example, an obsession truly an obsession, particularly in the 16th century, with the question of you know, the, the, the fact that the more, the better. The more bodies, ooh, five minutes, no. Oh, I'm, uh, okay. All right. Um, okay, let's say 10. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, yes, I know, because, okay. That's not. So 
I'm trying to make a connection between the theories on population that uh, were developing in the mercantilist period and the practices about population, the practices that the, the early capitalist class put into place to, in fact, uh, gather, right, increase the size of the workforce. Think of the slave trade, right? Slavery. Why all of a sudden you have, uh, you know, the, 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 the beginning of the slave trade, the plantation. This is very much part of that accumulation of capital, capital in the sense of human capital. So I'm making a connection between the new interest in procreation, uh, the new demonization of contraception, the, and also the legislation that is passed in this period, which is making any form of contraception or abortion a capital punishment. Many, many women were beheaded, were hanged, you know, in fact, uh, uh, infanticide, what they called infanticide, which was understood in a very broad way, uh, was the second largest crime in the 16th, 17th century after witchcraft. Witchcraft and in infanticide, and you can see a connection between the witches, in my view, being called, you know, enemies of children, as well as enemies of God, and also, the legislation which is passed, which is criminalizing contraception. And uh, I'm making an argument, which I cannot make very convincingly perhaps now, but an argument that this has very much to do with a no, new relationship towards labor and has very much to do with the concern about the accumulation of the population. Uh, there are many other experts of the witch hunt that I want to also speak about. But I'm going to have to do it much more quickly. There is another area of crime which has to do with sexuality, sexual crime. The, pro the witch is often a woman who has been a prostitute in her youth, or a woman who has had children out of wedlock. And I'm certainly connected, connecting uh, the attack on witches with the whole attempt that in this period the capitalist class had to do with regulating sexuality in a sense to domesticate sexuality, you know, in, prevent sexuality from becoming a subversive power, subversive of the discipline of work, right? And uh, also the witch hunt was very much instrumental to creating new relationship between women and men, a new division between women and men, presenting witches and women who you know, use their power against men and the attack on uh, the charge the women make men impotent, right? It's very much part of this strategy. Uh, I'll use the last few minutes I have to say that although the witch hunts of the 16th, 17th century uh, occupy in Europe, occupy a good part of the book, there are also other themes in the book. First of all, the witch hunts that took place in the same period and also later in the American colonies. And uh, you know, with similar results, although sometimes they took different forms. So that is very clear that you begin to have a kind of sexual politics, a sexual politics of the capitalist class, which uh, is exported you know, begins in Europe, but is also exported to the American colonies, where you also have witch hunts, and where in the first, in an early period, they are targeting men and women, men as well, but more and more become focused on women, because one of the concerns of the colonizer was also to establish different relationship between women and men, and different hierarchy that had existed before. Another important part of the book, which I think uh, um, was very interesting for me to develop, was also uh, an analysis that about the transformation that the body, our body, uh, had undergone, went through in the transition to capitalism. Uh, continuing with the idea that uh, the analysis that, for example, Marx provides 
you know, of the period of transition of primitive accumulation is extremely limited. That there is a whole history that is not seen, that too much focus only on the peasant, on the expulsion of the peasantry is too limited, that focus, exclusive focus. And that equally important has been the institution of uh, legislation, practices, and so on, which have transformed the body of the, a pre-capitalist body into a body that could be disciplined for the new type of activities that uh, the capitalist discipline of work imposed, right? So I look at what I call the mechanization of the body, the, bo the process by which we go from a body that was con conceived as having all kinds of magical powers into a body that more and more is conceived as a machine, right? In other words, a body now that is seen only from the point of view of the work that can be extracted from it, right? And there's a whole orchestration, there's a, a whole uh, ideological as well as practical that basically is placed, put into place, right, to, to create this body, right? It's, uh, now, last remark is that when I was writing this book, I was often having to close the pages because they were so painful. And even though I've been super critical about this society, super critical, uh, sometime I'll say to myself, well, at least today we don't have witch hunts. But I was wrong because in fact, over the last uh, 25 years, at least now, uh, starting with the mid 80s, very much in the context of the advance of capitalist relation across the world, we have seen a return of witch hunting. And uh, if we had another hour, we could talk about it, but maybe in the discussion we can touch on it. You know, in many parts of Africa, in many countries of Africa, in many parts of India, particularly in the tribal area, the area of the Adivasi and other tribal communities. Uh, Nepal, more recently in Papua New Guinea, you may have seen the pictures of women being born. The, the Spiegel published just three or four weeks ago. Thousands and thousands of women have been uh, killed, tortured, on charge of being witches. Uh, again, we are in the realm of madness. No, we are not in the realm of madness, of course. You, we can answer it that way. But in reality, uh, what is taking place, in my view, is that we are witnessing, to some extent, phenomena similar to those that took place at the beginning of capitalism, because to the extent the globalization is the world extension of capitalist relation, across the world, entire communities have to be transformed that still were not fully capitalized. Land has to be expropriation, expropriated. Ways of living, ways of thinking, struggles have to be defeated, beginning with all those struggles that have to do with attachment to a pre-capitalist mode of being. Attachment, for example, to a pre-capitalist relationship to the land you know, to the trees that goes against the commercialization of this, of this wealth, yeah? from wealth to resources, and uh, which in fact sees women still in a way in the foreground of a defense of a world that for them is fundamental to their survival because women have had less of a relationship to the monetary world. And so to the extent that uh, you have now many, many interested, whether it is mining company, agribusiness, agrofuel, well, basically moving on these areas and trying to take them over, expropriate and commercialize them. They also have to do away <laughs> with a whole uh, set of people who stand in the way because they are backward, because they don't want to sell the trees, because they are still attached to subsistence agriculture. And uh, 
there is a process of ideological devaluation of these people that I believe plays very much in the hands of the witch hunters. Uh, and last comment, hand in hand with the advance of this commercial interest in these parts of the world where we've seen a renewal, a return of witch hunting. We are also seeing uh, the phenomenon of evangelization, which is really pattern on you know, the evangelization of the 16th, 17th century, when they sent the missionaries to the Americas, right? The Inquisition went to the Americas. Well, now we have this evangelical sect. You find them all over. They are all over Africa. They are all over Papua New Guinea. And uh, interesting enough, uh, they have been promoting, they have a lot of resources, and they have been promoting a creed, a very militant, combative form of Christianity that basically says becoming rich is good. And, you know, it's a sort of a new uh, rehearsal of Calvinism. If you're not rich, if you're poor, that means there's something wrong with you. Or it means that in your community, there's somebody who is actually evil. And in fact, this evangelical sect have re-injected into the religious discourse the notion of the devil and the notion of demonization. And uh, it's very clear that there is a connection between the economic processes that are taking place and this new ideological you know, propaganda, this new ideological campaign that certainly plays a tremendous role in fomenting this new fear you know, of witches, of witchcraft, particularly detrimental at the time when communities are under attack and they should be unified in terms of resisting right, the new type of enclosures that uh, are being taking place. But it's very convenient, of course, if they fight among each other. And uh, there is a tremendous deja vu. Thank you so much.